Hello and welcome back. Uh, I would like to, you know, say the obvious thing that e-waste is a really frustrating problem. And I think it's not hard for pretty much everyone to see that there must be a better way for us to deal with this. And while, you know, efforts for better manufacturing and recycling plans are improved, people like Arsenius, our next speaker, um, are taking a shot at reusing component hardware to extend its life and, you know, keep it out of the landfill that way from batteries and webcams to motherboards and chargers, he's gonna take us through his approach to repurposing the functional components from otherwise dead equipment. I'm happy to welcome our next Hackaday Remoticon speaker, Arsenius. So I'm a bit nervous, haven't given a talk in a long time. Uh, thank you for the opportunity. And uh, I don't quite know why any of you specifically are here. I know some of you are here because you have just a few laptops that you would like to take apart and reuse. Some of you may be like me at times, you're on the budget and you just need parts to do all kinds of different projects. And maybe you're just looking to upgrade your daily driver laptop to maybe make it work uh, better for your goals. Uh, but uh, there's a high level principle for me on why I do this. And uh, the reason is that I believe that in the future we might have to, uh, some of us will have to build more uh, portable devices on our own. Uh, currently laptops uh, and a lot of other devices are moving into the becoming more proprietary direction. And the, on the opposite side we have uh, values like uh, repairability, like private, privacy consciousness like uh, waste uh, elimination and all of these are clear, clearly clearly conflicting with the proprietary direction we are currently being taken in and that means we have to we will have to at some point take matters in the, our own hands one of these uh, one of the ways we can do that is through reverse engineering and i would like to sort of equip you with a toolkit on how specifically and what specifically you can do. Because, you know, until you have the toolkit, maybe you don't even know what's possible for you. Hopefully that explains my motivations and now time for a bit of an info dump. So I should be sharing the screen now. Does it work? Yep, looks good from here. Okay, you can see the slides on the screen, I, uh, slides on the screen I assume, right? Yep, we can. Yep. Okay. So the obvious parts, I'm not going to be talking, and that's uh, uh, sorry, small hiccup. So hard disk drives, SSDs, RAM. I'm not going to be talking about reusing those. What I will have a side note about is that you can actually reuse USB Wi-Fi cards. Uh, no, mini PCI Express Wi-Fi cards with built-in built Bluetooth as high-quality Bluetooth dongles which is probably the best quality Bluetooth dongle you can get. And the simplest option is that you just solder wires, USB and 3.3 volt power, and you get a dongle that, unlike the cheap dollar store dongles, it doesn't break as those dongles do. It has decent driver support and with the antennas got, that you can get from the same laptop, they, you get uh, quite a bit of range compared to those, those dongles. Further on, if you go into the laptop hacking, you will need schematics. You will, I mean, you will hugely benefit from schematics. You can find schematics for your own laptop or maybe similar la laptops online. And uh, board views are also useful. If you cannot find schematics, uh, it's good. It's still good. You can still do a lot, especially given how many schematics there are available uh, online. But it's better if you have those. So displays, you can definitely reuse displays. Uh, older ones follow the LVDS signaling uh, standard. Newer ones for, follow the EDP standard, which is embedded display port, which basically means that the simplest and the most powerful option you're going to get is to solder a display port cable into a, la uh, to a laptop panel and uh, plug it into your GPU, which is unironically an option. And I don't know why more people don't take this, but uh, Either way, you will need uh, backlight connections, which usually backlight needs uh, 12 volts or whatever is the typical battery voltage around that. 
and also you will typically need two logic level signals uh enable which is a logic level signal and adjust which is a logic level pwm signal for brightness if you use a ccfl uh, um, panel which is uh, like old backlight type usually lvds you will need an inverter you can typically reuse a laptop inverter and yeah same connections as the leds so it's very it's straightforward to reuse everything but you can also buy a inverter Typically, if you want to reuse a panel, you can just take the model number, plug it into eBay, buy the $20 kit, and you go. Uh, but if you would like to actually know like everything about the panels, or maybe you want to reuse it in a power-efficient way, or maybe you want to make a really slim project, uh, I've been building a knowledge database. It's like 30% complete, currently in hold. But there's al already a lot of information on how you can uh, uh, how you can actually understand the uh, display uses intricacies, and I've been also be, uh, compiling a Hackaday I/O project list. Also links down there, so you can look through what other people have been building. Mm, oh, this is uh, just an example of a project that I'm actually at this very moment I'm using for the streaming. So it's a second monitor that I'm currently using. It cost me fifty dollars in parts. It's a touchscreen IPS Full HD monitor. It's very high quality, and currently it's my it's my best second monitor. Uh, I've also in that project that I've mentioned there's a build log on how I reused like all the parts for this, and some other build build, log, build logs. Okay. A lot of devices inside lab, laptops are USB devices. So mostly these are touch screens, webcams, fingerprint sensor. So what this means is that they are typically plug and play. And it's very easy for to just have them work. Sometimes you need drivers. And uh, you need to supply typically 3.3 volts, sometimes 5 volts. You need to be careful on which one the device needs, because if, if it's 5 volts when it needs 3, then you're going to destroy it. But again, the schematics are going to help, or a board view is going to help. And uh, specifically about webcams, I also have an old Hackaday project that has instructions about webcams that will apply to also touch screens and fingerprint sensors, which is nice. Uh, touchpads, though. Touchpads is a little bit more complicated topic. I haven't actually gotten into it uh, much myself. And uh, all touchpads are typically PS2. And I've heard a lot of stories about people using USB to PS2 adapters with those with great success. I have a hunch and I think that I've heard that the gesture support is incomplete because it's not quite part of the original spec of, of PS2 or something. And if you have I2C touchpad, then it's basically a nice device that you don't know anything about. So you need to know the initialization sequence. You need to know the you need to know the commands and if you if you get the logic analyzer which you should uh i will talk about that uh you will be able to get all of that and uh, reverse engineer the communication protocol and then reuse a newer touchpad which are nicer and like smoother and everything and the project link is uh, a hackaday ai project that you should check out of someone reusing a, a lap, like laptop size the full size touchpad the size of entire like keyboard and it's a nice project and it will give you insights into what's necessary. Logic analyzers, uh, quite a, a, like quick interlude, spend five dollars or like up to 10 euros on eBay for a logic analyzer. You can use it with fully free open source software. It will step up your reverse engineering skills if you don't have one already. This analyzer can do streaming. It can do quite respectable megahertz and uh, you can reverse engineer a lot of communication protocols with that. You can definitely reuse batteries. Most people take them apart for cells, uh, but uh, a battery, a laptop battery, is a 2S, 3S, 4S lithium-ion pack. You typically don't get midpoint connections. They're internal. Uh, you, you get a VBAT, you get ground. The charging circuitry is never inside the battery. It's usually always on the motherboard. So you also need to connect some kind of charger module. But the battery has certainly has protection and monitoring inside. And I'm not sure, but uh, 
it probably has internal balancing. I genuinely, genuinely don't know. Uh, I2C protocols. I think there is some open, like open standard subset for battery communications, like smart battery or something. But I know that there is also proprietary communications, and you can also connect uh, the battery to a laptop, uh, connect the logic analyzer, and uh, sniff the communications. If you are interested in uh, some laptop battery IC work, I have a stash of IC sorted by like controller uh, name, and uh, you just let me know. I can probably share some of you if you're looking for some specific ones. Uh, common pins, you will see from schematics. If you don't have those, usually ground, one or two grounds, one or two battery pins. I2C, sometimes there is an enable output pin, which uh, you have to pull to ground or somewhere else to get the output. But if there is no output, it's also possible that you just have a dead battery. Sometimes there's an alert pin and some kind of like maybe interrupt pin for I2C. Again, schematics help. Or you can just take the cells and you can also take the Ultrabook batteries part for the cells, uh, which I have uh, gotten quite a few nice flat cells this way. But of course, uh, just like fruit, it helps if they are uh, ripe for the picking. So you might have to wait a little bit. By the way, if you, if you have a Dale, I'm I'm sorry, this is a kind of common problem. You might encounter it in the future. Speakers, microphones, kind of obvious. Atom speakers, they are usually in a, like black casing of some kind. This casing is, as far as I know, is acoustically matched. So the volume of air inside is calculated. The like uh, shape inside is calculated. So don't take the speakers out of the case. It's probably going to sound worse. Digital microphones, unless you know the part number, not very reusable in my view. Uh, you have to know whether it's I2S or PDM, just like, you know, with the microphones you sometimes get on the webcams. Also, you need some kind of microcontroller to connect the uh, to uh, convert the formats into something that a computer can easily understand, unless you use it with a micro microcontroller to begin with. And analog microphones, I mean, you know how to re reuse analog microphones, just a capacitive microphone. Fans, you can definitely reuse fans, especially helps if uh, they have color coded wires because some have and some don't. If you do have color coding, this is these are the colors you will typically see. If you don't have the color coding, like all the wires are black or some different colors, then it helps if you have schematics. Again, I might be repeating myself here, but also it ha you can do some multimeter probing. So figure out the internal ESD diodes kind of maybe, you know, try to spin the fan and generate a voltage, that kind of stuff. If you miswire the fan and where you, where you don't know the pinout and you try to send five volts to you, to the pins that you've selected, you're going to fry it, uh, you're going to fry it. That's a pretty consistent experience in my book. And then, yeah, once you have done it, you can reuse the fan as you wish. You can definitely reuse heat sinks. Yeah, that's a curse picture. If you want to reuse heatsink, uh, you can basically use it for some kind of project where you have a portrait and maybe a slim form factor. So form factor, so you connect the transistor to the heatsink, and then uh, you you know you cool it. That's exactly what those heatsinks uh, are used for. And then you also reuse the fan in the same way. I think that's cool. Uh, you can reuse chargers for sure. So. Uh, What's the next slide? I forgot. Oh, yeah. Let's talk about charger voltages. So 18, 19, 20, they are kind of a scam because uh, the reason we have 19 and 18, as far as I understand, m most of the time is that there is in some kind of countries, there is a standard that if you have 12, 20 volt or higher power supply, you need to apply to for additional uh, certifications. And usually you can uh, uh, just run 19 and 18 volt laptops on 20 volts. In fact, that's what I'm doing right this very this very moment. I think it works, right? Would be ironic if it didn't. Uh, I wouldn't suggest you go with 24 volts though. It uh, it's tempting, but a lot of capacitors on the main power line inside the laptop are rated for 25 volts, and 24 is just a bit too close. Um, What's next? Oh yeah, Dell. So Dell, uh, 
Mm, you have uh, the whole trinity of proprietary stuff, which is Dell, HP, and Lenovo. And let's talk about charger wattage identification. So in Dell chargers, the, there is a third wire from the charger to the plug. And this wire is connected to a one wire EEPROM, which has a charger wattage and encoded in ASCII. So you can fake that with an tiny. You can buy those replacement uh, ICs with in from AliExpress if you don't have the access to original ICs. So if you need to, like if you need to connect uh, like a Dell, like a power supply to a Dell, that's how you do it. With HP, it's the same third wire, but there's a high value resistor from VCC to from 19 volts to the AD pin. And that third wire breaks a lot. And when it does, the laptop is not going to charge the battery or without the battery, it's not, it's not going to boot up or with the, with the battery, it's going to throttle the CPU. So look out for that. You usually can easily fix the wires. Lenovo has a third wire system, which is well documented by ThinkPad enthusiasts, which are like a special breed of people. It's wonderful. Uh, and uh, the resistor is in, inside the plug. So you only have the wires. It's more resilient. They break less. And if they do break, it's, it's also quite easy to repair them. One thing, if you want to repair a charger, don't buy these seriously. Take apart the original plug with exacto knife and uh, resolder it. This plug in the photo has been seen well in like hard conditions for three years now. Uh, after the repair I've done, and it's just the these they always break. They're not adequate. And what's next? Oh yeah, definitely don't do this though, uh, please. If you need to take the charger apart, if it doesn't have any rubber feet, that you can, uh, that there's like screws under, uh, then you, the best you can do is to take a chisel and a hammer because then uh, chances are it's ultrasonically welded. So what you do is you take the chisel, you take the hammer and you bang it uh, through the perimeter of the charger until it's, uh, like through the slot in the middle. And then, you know, when when it's uh, when it's open, you do whatever you need to do. And then you can even neatly uh, super glue it together. No need for any kind of uh, electric type stuff. Keyboards, just a fancy key matrix. Oh yeah, say you can definitely re reuse those. Key matrix, no diodes like mechanical keyboards. So anti-ghosting is, uh, is uh, by design of the keyboard key matrix layout. So there's like a weird way to lay out the matrix, like rows with one key on them and so on. Sometimes there's LEDs and separate buttons, like the power button on the same FPC. You can use a microcontroller to reverse engineer the pinout by pressing keys and seeing which keys uh, get connected to which one. You can use then that same controller or the microcontroller or different controller as a controller. These keyboards are really thin and nice. Thank God for the economies of scale. And uh, uh, if you want some instructions, there is some good instructables and hacked AI projects. Just don't do this though, please. Okay, y you know who you are. Uh, this is my solution that I've done for reverse engineering. Basically, you plug it onto a Raspberry Pi, you run a Python script, it asks you to press keys like all keys of a keyboard and uh, you press those and it records the pins. So you can spend like three minutes to reverse engineer a keyboard and uh, you can buy it from me if you'd like. I've recently started selling it, but also it's uh, I two I2C expanders in a trench coat and all my products are open source. So if you want, you can take the schematics and uh, take my script and just uh, assemble your own solution if you'd like. Mm -hmm. Let's start about, let's talk about reusing whole laptops and modifying whole laptops. You might remember this. Uh, this is the project that actually got me started uh, on laptop modding. So the, you know, whole like, it's important to build our own laptops thing. That's a post hoc justification. Not that it's not important, but still people have built, uh, people have built the craziest things with those like all kinds of peripherals inside it's just mad and my mods haven't been so successful but i sure have uh, learned a lot 
uh, one thing I'm going to warn you about if you're disassembling your own laptop, a uh, very common cause of that is that you unplug the LCD connector uh, before you have unplugged both the battery and the IC power cable. So you have to unplug both. Otherwise, you're probably going to kill your motherboard because there is potential for uh, volt high voltage power lines to show short to data lines. And then you can probably kill the CPU, the chipset, whatever else. Please just unplug everything, OK? Uh, what I think is that we need more laptop modding. I've been talking to a friend like a month ago and she asked like, why don't we have uh, more lap? Why don't we have like laptop uh, uh, mod chips like we used to do in game consoles? And I was, I started explaining like, oh, this is the reason, this is the reason. And then I was personally like, oh, actually, yeah, why, why don't we do those? And turns out there's some great mod chips, especially ThinkPad community because ThinkPads. Anyway, so this is a model that taps into a certain model ThinkPads, uh, th certain ThinkPads model uh, uh, dock pins, and it allows you to put a high definition display with this interposer port into your into your uh, ThinkPad uh, where it was never meant to be, and. Uh, uh, it's just something that you solder into your laptop, connect a few wires, and it starts functioning. And that's amazing to me. Uh, oh, yeah, that's what I mentioned about disconnecting power. Uh, and think that the users have done a lot of different mods that it's re seriously too many to share. And I don't think I can seriously just look into those. Uh, there's a lot of inspiration you can do, you can get. And I hope that we also expand into other laptops like this QT I have here. It's uh, my personal, like one of my personal collection laptops. And I hope that I also can do some mod boards for, uh, for this one. I've recently started a, a mod board project, which I hope to also soon start selling, which is basically a boot uh, device for BIOS chips. So you can have a, you can have a, like a stable firmware BIOS chip that you boot from, and also like a socketable BIOS uh, uh, that you can switch to and try booting your main laptop from. So you no no longer are uh, limited to like doing BIOS re research on burner laptops, which is limiting. Uh, there should be more about BIOS in in a, in a moment, but M.2 you should definitely read the M.2 specs. M.2 as a standard is very cool. Oh yeah, that's a SSD sewn in half, and that works. That's that's an SSD that uh, still works somehow. M.2 is seriously impressive, and you can get the like uh, specifications online, and there's like all kinds of PCI Express devices that you can actually like interconnect. And there's more. You can actually, in some laptops out there, there there's like a Wi-Fi card that actually has two PCI Express links, and also has Display Port. And if you make uh, like a port for that, well, okay, as long as it works in your laptop, because different M.2 slots, uh, even if they look the same, they have different capabilities. Depends on the laptop. Uh, and you should really. It, it helps if you have the schematics. If you don't, well, you can still experiment. And specifications help, help you figure out stuff a lot. And uh, something I've done is a uh, adapter that you can use to connect uh, SSD in place of your Wi-Fi adapter that I'm also going to start selling soon. You get uh, like some exposed USB pins you can solder to in case you still need the USB Wi-Fi for some reason. Because why would you need that if you have like eight terabytes of storage on an SSD? And it's not going to work with whitelist. I'm going to mention whitelist. Don't worry, the whole Trinity applies. Uh, something that could be a gold mine is an adapter that abuses everything I've read about uh, in the specifications. And hopefully, if it works out, it uh, it's an M.2 card that allows you to put one SSD into a slot that's designed to accept one. BIOS modes, something that people should definitely look into. I have done some. Uh, lap uh, laptop manufacturers like HP, uh, Lenovo, Dell, they have whitelists. So they limit what kind of PCI Express devices you can put into your own laptop, which if you ask me, it's preposterous. 
And so if you hack your BIOS, you can uh, remove the whitelists and put like six SSDs into your laptop. Who can tell you otherwise? You can unlock your menus in your, bi in your BIOS. You, there is cool stuff and there is sad stuff. I'm going to mention the sad stuff. People usually use like the reflashing clips and oh yeah, the thing I've done personally is that I've doubled the security of uh, a laptop. If you zoom in, you can see the doubled security. Uh, you can also see that you should back up the original version before uh, reflash. And uh, sometimes there's uh, like all kinds of menus, but there is also side effects. Uh, if you use clips, it's not impossible that you will have problems. So it's like a clip on thing that uh, what's happening. Oh, yeah, uh, it's a clip on thing uh, that you just uh, flash uh, reflash uh, the bias chip in system. But uh, the power rail that you have to power also goes to other devices. So I personally always disolder the SPI chips before reflashing. And sometimes you can use this socket, which costs like two dollars in Taobao and uh, tell the ten dollars elsewhere per piece. So you should probably get them on Taobao. Uh, these devices actually are five volt data lines by default. Look out, you have to modify them to actually properly have the data lines at 3.3 uh, volts. Next thing, modern motherboards, they have SPI flash chips, which are connected directly to the CPU, and they are also connected to a CPU connected 1.8 power line, which means that the 3.3 volt clip is going to burn it. So I have a laptop that's on Ryzen uh, uh, 3500U, it's a, a, a like reasonably recent laptop and it has this problem and uh, be careful out there if you connect a clip uh, to such a lap uh, such a laptop before testing you're probably going to destroy something so look out mm. some benefit of uh, well tinkering with bios is that you find things that you were not supposed to find and i was looking through some bios research like a few years ago and I was like, oh, that's my laptop picture, the laptop I've, I've used for six years for every, everything I've been doing. And turns out it has some kind of cursed uh, Windows uh, hacking uh, BIOS um, UFI module that it just uh, injects uh, stuff into Windows that you cannot detect. And I was like, okay, nice, wonderful. Cool, someone was probably paid for this or something. Well, I, you should do it. There is a lot of stuff that people haven't uh, really heard about and people uncover things from time to time. Reusing motherboards, it's basically a small computer. There are some details. I am 27 minutes in, so check out I think the you, slides. I think you have time, so yeah, you, should just, uh, you should just finish up at your own Sorry? place. I think you've got... I think you've got a little bit of time, so just finish up at your own pace. Three minutes, right? Well, we have a 15 minute break coming up after this and it looks like um, even a little bit more than that. So I think it's fine to, to finish it out. Okay, I'm going to take a few more minutes. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, so when you're using motherboards, it's basically a small computer. Uh, sometimes you need an internal screen to see the BIOS, sometimes you don't. With Dell, you connect the speakers, it's going to beep out the codes that it's going, uh, that like any problems the motherboard has. Uh, Atom speakers are going to tell you that the codes are in line. You will usually need to find the power button, again, schematics help. Sometimes you need to fake the lead sensor if it's not present on the motherboard because the laptop will think that the lid is closed. Again, holy trinity, if you don't use the original power supply, fake it if you are just soldering 19 volt or 20 volt wires, add the resistor or ID chip or whatever you need. Uh, this is a water cooled laptop somehow. And it's an, yeah, it, it's a small computer, what can I say? And so there is a gaming option as well. Uh, you can see this guy runs Linux that's just uh, self-explanatory. Also schematics hot as usual. Uh, my personal like reused laptop that I adore is a backup machine. It's an i7 powered uh, uh, device uh, like motherboard with uh, four SATA ports. 
and the NAFRAM, it does uh, data recovery, it does uh, backups uh, from uh, like full, full drive backups for me. It does compression, it does encryption, it does like all kinds of stuff that I needed to do. And it's also very low power, so I can just leave it on for days at a time if I have a particularly glitchy hard disk drive. So I just personally just, I adore it. It's like, it's, it's, it's a great tool and you can build a lot of great tools with laptop parts. I2C, there is a lot of I2C in laptops. And uh, that means if you run Linux, you can connect your own I2C devices. You can uh, interface with the, those from C, C++, Python, Beth, JavaScript for some reason. And uh, you can get uh, I2C even from HDMI port. So we had example from like in Discord show and tell from someone and then uh, like uh, reflashing guys could see devices through HDMI and I'm also going to uh, sell my own adapter for this soon but you can also just get an a HDMI cable cut it in half get I square C question marks profit so that's the conclusion I believe that we should get a lot more from our laptops hopefully I have given you some of the tools you can use to make it so some of you are going to make your own laptops along the way godspeed if you are interested uh, first of all i will be publishing a lot of more research i've been doing this for years i'm not plan planning to stop it's a great topic if you would like join me i have a side project that i would like to start which is that someone should really start cataloging all laptop mods reuse examples and uh, scenarios that uh, exist out there so that people know what's possible and what can be done what's you know what's the information available to people and thank you if you have any questions i am on hackaday i'm on twitter feel free to dm me on any of these two platforms also if you like i'm going to talk about and uh, talk about laptop things on twitter specifically in the future Follow me there specifically when I, after I wake up, I'm probably going to try and uh, describe uh, why the cursed M.2 adapter specifically is cursed. And I hope you will like it if you follow me. Thank you. I hope this is going to help you in your, your adventures. There is so much more to talk about. And hopefully with some of you, we can work on it together. Good luck.